Hello, my name is Dr. Mary Wendt. I am going to do what I call a reading protocol. This is meant to walk you through how to read an academic article. I've chosen a particularly short one so that I can get through the whole thing um, in a shorter amount of time, but the idea should be the same. So this is to help you understand how you can read for information, do a critical reading, how to make annotations, and how to get the most out of what you read. This information is from the title page. So the important things to note here, um, especially number one is the title, right? If the title should tell you something. So that's a good place to start. Um, we have three parts to this title. So the first part is public doublespeak. So um, that's going to be part one. Critical reading is going to be part two. Verbal action is going to be part three. So. Um, if a title is good, it should set you up for what to expect when you read an article. So we'll be looking about uh, looking for information about doublespeak, about critical information, and about verbal action. So this um, gives us a clue as to what the article should be about, if it's a good title. Not all titles are really helpful, but this one I think probably is. This is the information you need to do your um, in-text citations and your works cited page. And this is just from JSTOR. Okay, so I'm going to read aloud. As I'm reading aloud, I'm going to take notes. As I take notes, I will um, give a sort of thought process. I'll talk aloud about my thought process and why I'm making the notes I'm making so you get a sense of how to read and read for information. All right, to begin. Public doublespeak is an abuse of language power and people. Okay, first thing I want to note, I want to note right away that this is definitely meant to be an opinion piece. Um, this is meant to be rhetorical, persuasive. This is not going to be a an informative article. And I can tell just by the, the tone of the language here, they're saying something very um, powerful. Okay, consequently, it is also a learning opportunity. So it's two things here. It's an abuse and it's a learning opportunity. An excellent site for investigating and understanding the power of discourse. Doublespeak provides salient instances of how language works, how it influences responses to what it names, how it directs and deflects attention, changes attitudes, motivates actions. This sounds like a thesis statement. How do I know it sounds like a thesis statement? Um, it's giving a sort of a list here. It's saying what it does. So this whole paragraph has a sort of thesis to it. It's saying what doublespeak is and what it does. It provides it provides instances of how language works, how it influences responses, how it directs and deflects attention, changes attitudes, and motivates action. So it's giving a list of what it does that probably has to do with that third part of the title um, about um, the verbal action. So it's talking about what, what doublespeak, I'm going to call it DS, what doublespeak actually does. And so I think this is probably the thesis or the main idea. Okay, doublespeak may not be typical language use, but is archetypical, prototypical, exemplary, exemplary, which is to say it provides wonderfully, uh, choice of words, extreme examples of discourse pragmatics and rhetoric. Doublespeak embodies many of the kinds of deceitful discourse that critical reading should unmask. Okay, so here's another point that this author is making, that if you're a good critical reader, you should be able to read, find, see this deceit. So it's saying that it's not typical, you don't use it all the time, but when you do see it, you should be able to understand that what you are reading is doublespeak. So maybe that's where this article is going with its purpose is to unmask or help us think about what doublespeak is. So this might have something to do with the purpose. Um, we'll keep reading to see if I'm right. Doublespeak is a deceitful abuse of language, the use of language to mislead. So here we have more defining going on. However egregious, out and out lies, the sort of untruths for which one might be legally politically liable are not doublespeak. Okay, so here it's saying what it is not. Doublespeak involves statements that are formally true. Okay, doublespeak is true. 
In some legalistic or technical sense, doublespeak seems to communicate, but it actually deceives. So it seems to communicate, but it actually deceives. This is key. Because the very act of using language implies an intention to communicate, doublespeak, which communicates either misinformation or no information, is an abuse of language and language users. All right, so this whole paragraph feels like it's a definition and it uh, it is defining what doublespeak actually is. So this idea that their purpose is to help us recognize doublespeak seems to be pretty accurate so far. What this article is trying to do is help us see what doublespeak actually is and what it does. So it's saying here that um, to sum up this paragraph, it implies language implies an intention to communicate. This is what language is supposed to do, but because doublespeak doesn't do that, it's an abuse. Okay, simple examples. This is examples. Genuine imitation leather, virgin vinyl, real toy telephone. So those are some examples of doublespeak. The first annual public doublespeak award, which I did not know existed, <laughs> Uh, given by the National Council of Teachers of English in the United States, went to United States Air Force press officer in 1973 for asserting that air support is not bombing. After a U.S. bombing raid in Cambodia, the officer rebuked reporters. You always write it's bombing, bombing, bombing. It's not bombing, it's air support. Okay, so here's an, this is another example. What is really scary, huh, scary, so we should be afraid of this, is that like this officer, some of the generals deciding whether to provide air support were using such language to deflect attention, including their own, from the fact that they were ordering bombs dropped on people, probably whole villages. Instead, by renaming it air support, they were redirected or they directed attention to supporting our boys and who would dare argue that our soldiers risking their lives to defend our way of life, not to mention the economic interests of our elites, did not deserve our support. Okay, so this example is, uh, this whole paragraph is, all, is just an example of both doublespeak and its effects. Okay, so dropping bombs on people and calling it air support is one of the reasons it is dangerous. So that's good to know, good example. Sometimes doublespeak seems to be an attempt to use a lot of words while actually communicating little information on clearly. Okay, so here we have lots of words. Some more definition, perhaps? While actually communicating little information, as in a memo announcing materiality of adjustments in relation to assigned work, production quotas, or when an airline representative announced we're in a flight overload situation, i.e. the airline sold too many tickets, or, so we're getting more examples here, or the Canadian Treasury Board memo said that the communication and exchange of ideas on administrative policy matters is encouraged and maintained to optimize the use mix and cost of administrative inputs and program results. That is a lot of words. My guess is that this sentence allowed its author to have his cake and eat it too. That is to be on record as having invited suggestions without saying anything that might actually encourage suggestions. Okay, so we have a whole bunch of examples um, still. Sometimes doublespeak seems to pretty clearly be an attempt to lead astray. Oh, this is a new topic. Okay, so these are examples of doublespeak using lots of words. This seems a lot less damaging doesn't it, than um, the bombing incident. So these are examples of doublespeak not necessarily being very um, damaging. Okay, new example. Sometimes doublespeak seems to be pretty clearly an attempt to lead astray, as when U.S. Secretary of State, I'll make note of that, Haig told the Congressional Committee investigating the murder of four church women in El Salvador. Okay, so here we're talking about murder, probably more serious. This is his quote from Haig. I'd like to suggest to you that some of the investigations would lead one to believe, I'd like to suggest, lead one to believe that perhaps the vehicle that the nuns were riding in may have tried to run a roadblock or may have accidentally been perceived to have been doing so. And there'd been an exchange of fire 
people shot at each other. And then perhaps those who inflicted the casualties, inflicted the casualties, <laughs> sought to cover it up. And this could have been at a very low level of both competence and motivation in the context of the issue itself. But the facts on this are not clear enough for anyone to draw a definitive conclusion. This definitely sounds like that kind of language you hear politicians speak when they answer questions and don't say anything. All right, so let's see what they say about this. Note the qualifiers. Yep, I certainly did. <laughs> I'd like to suggest some, perhaps lead one, many, may or may, accidentally, etc. Ten qualifiers in three sentences. Note the euphemisms. Okay, so it's saying it's euphemisms as, as well. Ch exchange of fire, very low level of both competence and motivation. Note the gobbledygook. Okay, so it's adding to this list in the context of the issue itself. Uh, note the passive deflections of real subjects. More. The vehicle the nuns were riding in, not the woman who was driving it, may have tried to run the roadblock or may accidentally have been perceived by whom? to have been doing so. And consider the possibility, given that three nuns and a lay worker had been shot in the backs of their heads, and that three of them had been raped, of drawing a just slightly less than definitive conclusion that what Haig suggests is bizarrely improbable. Okay, so what were the authors doing here is adding to this list and helping us, using these examples, to help us recognize To help us recognize doublespeak by giving us another some more to add to this list. Euphemisms, gobbledygook, passive deflections. These are all doublespeak. Even the Congressional Committee, quite accustomed to doublespeak, wanted to know what Haig meant by an exchange of fire. According to his subsequent explanation, Haig meant to communicate, meant to communicate, that a Salvadorian soldier might accidentally have fired a shot that was perceived by soldiers on the other side as coming from the vehicle, after which the soldiers exchanged fire through the vehicle and just happened to hit each woman just once in the back of the head. Yeah, right. But the doublespeak issue is rhetorical more than semantic. Okay, this is an important thing to note here. Maybe something that is quote worthy usually mark things that I think maybe I'll want to quote. So um, saying that doublespeak is rhetorical more than semantical has to do with intention, that it's a deliberate persuasion, deliberate <laughs> persuasion, more so than it is just a matter of word choice. Right, so it's not just the words that they're using, but the way that they're put together rhetorically to create an effect. And that's, I think, a really important quote here. This one I'll want to quote. Haig was clearly defecting the committee from concluding, perhaps not absolutely definitively, that Salvadorian soldiers raped and murdered three nuns and another church woman. Okay. Motive is key. Okay, we're getting a header here. Anytime we get a header, we know that the author is giving us, moving to another point, I believe. So up until now, the point, uh, point one has sort of been about defining uh, doublespeak, telling us what it is. Here they're talking about motive and why that's key. So let's see what they have to say. So this is probably point number two. To unmask doublespeak, we need to ask not so much what do these words say as what does this utterance do? Okay, so here's the key question. If we want to be good critical readers, and I think that's what we're going into next, is to look at what the utterance does. What does it do when logging old growth rainforest is renamed harvesting over mature timber? When getting fired is renamed being selected out? When an inv when an invasion is renamed first pre-dawn vertical insertion and then rescue mission, when to cite a bit of doublespeak that succeeded during the Vietnam War, but which the media unmasked during the Gulf War, the bombing of a civilian hospital is renamed collateral damage, when a tax increase is renamed revenue enhancement, receipt strengthening, or tax base broadening. When educators talk about procedural facilitation instead of just showing learners how to do something, 
When portable toilets are renamed natural amenity units, an offense becomes a non-ecological boundary. How much more would your government government's bureaucracy pay for a manually powered fastener driving impact device than for a hammer. Okay, this is a bunch of examples again of what the utterances do. They don't actually answer the question what they do. You're supposed to you're supposed to get that, I guess, from this. What do these things do? And think about what these phrases do when we change what they mean or when we use double speak. Motive, though not necessarily conscious intention, is key. Okay, so here he's actually separating conscious intention from motive. So sometimes our motives behind what we're doing is more important than actually deli being deliberate. They're pretty hard to parse, but okay. The very same linguistic devices that constitute doublespeak in one context may be good, useful, considerate in another context. Okay, let's see where he's going with this. Euphemism, for example. Okay, so he's going to give an example. Euphemism, for example, is a common doublespeak technique, as when the U.S. State Department decided it would no longer use the word kill in its reports on human rights abuse. In, okay, so here we're talking about kill. In State Department doublespeak, Death squads thereafter merely engaged in the unlawful or arbitrary deprivation of life, i.e. kill. But if my friend's father has just died and I use the euphemism passed away to be gentle and considerate of my friend's feelings, this is not double speak. Okay, so there, here, there, this is that. It's not, um, it has to do with motive. It is motive. Why we're, why we're using the double speak to begin with. That is why one always needs to know the rhetorical situation as well as context of situation and culture before one can tell whether a particular statement is double speak. Okay, so still the purpose here is still to help us identify. Identify double speak. But this is meant to tell us that the motive behind it, you can't just go by the words. You have to know the rhetorical situation. This is probably quote worthy again. So I'm going to mark this. Um, if we don't know the rhetorical situation that we see the language in, then um, we may not recognize whether or not it's actually double speak. Okay, skillful use of language. Here we have another header. So perhaps point number three although they all seem to be building on the same point. Double speak is not bad writing. It takes considerable skill to retitle a nut hexaformal, hexaform rotatable surface compression unit. Yeah, it does. And considerable something else if the purpose is to charge some government an extraordinary price for these units. So, okay. Double speak is also a different issue from the one raised by the plain language movement. So here we're doing another of what it is not. Here's another what it is not. Um, in most plain language cases, the obfuscation results less from a desire to deceive, though there may be a desire to evade communicating, than from not thinking about what needs to be done to communicate effectively with particular readers, especially those who lack background knowledge or do not read very well. Okay, so here it's just dif making a different differentiating between the plain language movement and bad writing and what double speak is. So it's saying what double speak is not. So more definition actually. Thus the nurse who announced on a radio program to teach certain diabetics to perform self glucose self blood glucose tests instead of one to teach them how to test their own blood for glucose was presumably not thinking about jargon. It's another example. Or nominalization. These are both double speak. And was currently or certainly not trying to obfuscate or deceive more double speak. But her public health training probably apparently did not include the defining principle of plain language, namely that it is the speaker or writer's responsibility to communicate in a way that most listeners or readers will understand. An expert who uses complex syntax and specialized vocabulary to address a public that includes large numbers of people who did not finish high school is a bad communicator and typically blames the victims for misunderstanding. Okay, so this is just more of what doublespeak is not. It's not bad communication. It's not um, 
using jargon that people can't understand or not knowing your it's so it's not double speak is not a matter of not knowing your audience which is what they're getting at here the fact that some people don't know their audience well but that doesn't mean that it's double speak okay double speak techniques include oh here we go this is going to give us a definition the abuse of euphem euphemism nominalization abstraction presupposition jargon titles and metaphor and other tropes as well as inflated language gobbledygook symmetrizing stipulative definition and ambiguity weasel words a lot but not all of what is called spin control or spin doctoring is double speak so this is a list of what to watch for still more defining of what doublespeak is doublespeak proliferates because it succeeds okay so here's why this is a why it's being used because double speakers and spin, spin doctors usually get away with it double speakers are usually more skillful in their abusive language than their audiences are at spotting the abuse that's pretty important i'm going to underline that whole thing thus the success of public double speakers their ability to manipulate language in ways that interfere with clear thinking and honest consideration of issues indicates that much of the public does not read skillfully enough this has to do with reading we need to be good readers though the public's ability, reading ability in many countries may be superior to what it was in the past when school dropout rates were higher it is not good or critical enough people are sufficiently fooled by public doublespeak so that many of their purchasing political and even personal decisions are made on the basis of misleading information all right and this is quote worthy definitely want to quote this because this is the result this is why double speak is effective so what i'm doing here um, is i am writing down some of the reasons why i would want to use this quote this is a really good quote so if i'm writing something and in my writing i want i want to think about what this article adds to the overall conversation about double speak one of the keys here are, are finding these things that the author says that help us understand it better and this is a key moment people are sufficiently fooled by public double speak so that many of their purchasing political and even personal decisions are made on the basis of misleading information and this is one of the keys as to why double speak is so dangerous why it's effective and dangerous and that is why I want to make note of this quote and that is a good quote to use all right deconstructing double speak okay and this is supposed to be some instructions maybe double speak should be of direct pro professional concern to those of us who study and teach language oh those of us this is audience is educators interesting i did not know that until this moment but as soon as they use the word us they're including themselves and the people who are reading we should interfere with the double speakers success by publicly embarrassing them and by enhancing people's critical re reading abilities we should do this both in the schools and through the same media abused by the double speakers so this is giving us some instruction in what we should be doing critical reading and defensive rhetoric i.e how not to be fooled by someone else's rhetoric are crucial abilities that should be defined as part of the basics a necessary part of instruction in, re in reading writing linguistics and rhetoric okay so if i were going to be writing something about education this would be a good quote it depends on what my paper is on why i'm reading this article but if i'm doing something about why critical reading is so important this would be an excellent quote for that after all if a reader reads something and understands all the words but gets a false message 
In a critical sense, that reader has failed to achieve the primary purpose for which he or she was reading. A very good point. Helping students learn how to deconstruct doublespeak is one of the most important ways we can help prepare them for life in societies manipulated through the mass media. Okay, so this really is all, it's sort of a call to action. And that's what this author is doing here is trying to appeal to teachers and saying, this is what we need to be doing. Double speakers, double speak to sell you something you do not really want to in intimidate, to impress and to evade responsibility. By abusing language, they cheat people and undermine democracy without actually lying. This is sort of a summary, this feels like. The impulse to cheat or to evade responsibility is probably no more widespread now than it was in decades and centuries past, but our society has changed. We have more, bu more bureaucracy and bigger corporations. More of our information comes through spokespeople and the mass media, which means that we less and less often deal face to face with the person responsible. And that creates a lot more opportunities for unethical business people, politicians, administrators, and others to manipulate us with doublespeak. Doublespeak, though hardly new, is increasingly problematic. That's kind of the point of this whole paragraph. So it's got this sort of nice summary in the beginning, but in the end, what it's just saying is that it's gotten worse. Notice one of the things that I do as I read is I always make it a point to sum up the paragraphs. And if the author has done a good job, they will make their paragraphs have just one sort of point. So the point of this one is that doublespeak has gotten worse, and that's why they have that paragraph. Doublespeak is the more, this is the last paragraph. Doublespeak is the moral equivalent of lying, but even more devious. Double speakers manipulate words to mislead people just as if they have lied, only they haven't lied, so they are rarely held legal or politically responsible. That's actually also really important. Seems like a conclusion's a bad place for this. Quote. So if I'm looking for something about why doublespeak works. This would be a good thing to quote. Doublespeak is a way of cheating people, getting them to buy something they wouldn't buy if they understood what it really was, be that a product, a service, a policy, expertise, or a politician. So it's really getting you to buy, buy something, including ideas. Okay, so now that I'm done reading this, I've noted a few things. One is that um, I've sort of summarized, and I think that the purpose um, of this whole article is to identify uh, what doublespeak is. So you always wanna be able to nail down that purpose. After you've read the article, you need to know what the purpose is of it. So it's a purpose goes way beyond a topic. The topic is doublespeak, you can get that easily. But the purpose is to help us identify doublespeak so that we can be better readers. And this is um, a key to understanding the whole context and why the author is doing what they're doing. If we can identify doublespeak, we can be better critical readers and um, not be fooled. We won't buy um, things that we don't want, services, policies, expertise. We won't buy ideas that are, are lies. So um, that is the purpose of this article. I've also made some notes of spaces of things that I think I should quote. So I, I found a quote um, that uh, will help me if I want to talk about the effect of doublespeak. I found one about teaching, um, and then I found one here about why it, why it works. And one of the things you want to do as you're reading is you want to, as you identify quotes, and you realize that they're saying something that's profound, where the language that they use, you, they say it better than you could. Those are the things you want to quote. And you want to think about what the quote actually does. So if the quote talks about the effects of doublespeak, then you would make note of that. So if you're writing a paragraph that is about the effects of doublespeak, 
you know where to go for that quote because you've identified it. Or if you're talking about what we can do as teachers, and we, because I'm a teacher, or what teachers can do or educators can do to help people understand, then you would go to that quote about teaching. Um, if you are writing a paragraph about doublespeak and why doublespeak works, then this last quote would be a good one. Um, so as you're thinking about how you wanna talk about the articles that you read, identifying what the point is of some of these particular quotes can help you as you are trying to think about what you're gonna talk about. This gives you a sort of a list of the kinds of um, discussions that you can have about that same topic. So that is my reading protocol and how to go about reading an article, understanding it as you read, marking it so that you understand it, so you can summarize it, so you can figure out the purpose of the article, which is really important, and to find particular quotes that you can use in your own writing.